You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. This is another edition of The Swamp Explained, where I talk to Rob Cortell, who is a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C. Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns like Ford and uh, H.W., government agencies like the EPA. He's been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Maritime Commission. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate. And he's also spent years working in private technology uh, in that sector with startup companies and uh, lived around Washington, D.C. for a long time. And, you know, he has uh, iconoclastic viewpoints, lots of experience, and he always gives us great insight into how people are thinking there in Washington, D.C. The reason we do this show is um, you know, if you're a libertarian and you want to start trimming down the swamp and the government, then you've got to understand it. Oftentimes, Rob, what I find in talking to people on social media is that their facts don't match reality. Gut gut feelings are not facts, but you wouldn't know that if you spent all day online. I I totally agree with that. Um, and you 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 know, there's an old saying that where you stand depends on where you sit. One mm-hmm. and two. Um, you know, this, uh, we were talking earlier offline, you and I, about Miles Taylor, a G- good example of, uh, of uh, people uh, both using someone for advantage and then uh, abusing them for advantage and everything else, you know. Yeah, let me, let, we can start here and then we're going to talk about uh, the 2020 race in this last episode of The Swamp before the election. We will on Monday night have another episode just to kind of tie it all together, a preview of election day. So tune in. And make sure you listen to that as well. But Miles Taylor is this guy who was the an assistant to uh, the Homeland Security. Was it Neil? Well, he was deputy chief of staff, and then okay. he later became chief of staff. And so, you know, when he he uh, at some point he gives us he he writes a story in the paper and and about being in uh, some meetings and being appalled. And then, of course, everyone knows it is true that there are a lot of people inside the administration. Uh, who are conflicted about one policy or another and kind of just the, their friends are banging on them about what a jackass <laughs> Donald Trump yeah, is. And we've seen it with people like uh, Kelly and yeah. Mattis and a lot yeah. of these, you said yeah. me an article with 29 different people. And Miles Taylor was there when uh, Kirsten, Kristen he was with, Ke- yeah, Kirsten. Yeah. And, and so and, during all these child separations, he was chief of staff during all right. that. And then around that time, the New York Times published this anonymous article. We talked about it here on the we did podcast, That's and right, right. And he was characterized as a senior administration official. Yes, and, and he and, wrote a book. Right, he wrote a book. And then and now he came he, out. He came out personally, and I heard him on the Bulwark podcast, which I thought was a very interesting look. And he left a two years, three years into into being this deputy chief of staff. And I found a lot of what he had to say convincing. He didn't seem like a nut. He didn't seem like a, yeah, you know, he, they, they, they kind of pushed him on being like, how could you, how could you like be there, be a part of the child separation and not say anything? And his argument was always, well, I wanted to be one of those people who stopped him. I thought he'd be different than he was. He wasn't. Now I'm speaking out, which I sort of buy well, that. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Well, and, and I'll, I'll say right up front, that reminds me of something my wife said to me, um, um, uh, at the beginning, before the last election in uh, 2016, which is, if he won, who would work for him? And right. what, I, what I said then is, anybody he asked, he's the president of the United States. And, yeah. and uh, people, uh, and in his case, I think a lot of people uh, who were Republicans, of course, it's in a Republican administration, they wanted to work in it. And, um, and they all had hopes that he would be different. He would uh, seize the moment. And then there are others who, um, uh, who, uh, think they're smarter than he is, and that they can change him. And it, it's always like that. It, it, you know, I that also reminds me of the story of you know George H. W. Bush and Jimmy Baker and Baker and and he and Baker were disagreeing. We talked about this before. And at some point, Bush said, "Well, if you're so smart, why aren't you president?" And <laughs> so these are the kinds of you know it's a human interaction, and and people do go into government for um, generally positive reasons. And generally, younger people go in to advance their careers. And I remember what I was like after uh, when I was in the Ford administration, I was, you know, 23 and four and later under Bush. And, uh, and you really, you, you have to kind of believe that what you're going to be able to do is good and a little independent of other stuff. So 
I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't uh, criticize them for doing it or being in it. Um, but what is interesting is in the beginning when the, he did the first article, you know, when they publish an article, they actually know, even if it's anonymous, they know who it is and, mm -hmm. and they can't, uh, and they agree to do it on the basis of their position that something bad will happen. So obviously they knew who he was and they, and they have to characterize it. So when the press goes out and, you know, they do it on background, they'll say, I just talked to a senior administration official who said, blah, 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 on background. And, uh, so now they're the nattering nabobs, as uh, uh, Spiro Wagner used to say, um, uh, and that was written by Patrick Buchanan, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for him, was it, it is, well, he is, was he really a senior administration official and should you give him any credibility? Well, well let me just say, uh, senior administration officials are not just cabinet officials or sub cabinet. They're people who run the agencies. So he was um, deputy chief of staff. Uh, and then chief of staff. So uh, by any definition, he was a senior official in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, he, he obviously reported directly to the secretary and the undersecretary, but he was a senior official. And if he was a senior official can, there, can, then he was a senior administration official and he had credibility to say it. And he was I, part of this I, generation. Uh, yeah, and he it sat is. in the white in the Oval Office. He sat. He briefed Donald Trump. So and he said he was in on don't... every major briefing. That would be absolutely true. While he was chief of staff. Yeah, can you kind of explain what a chief of staff does at that level for those who may not be familiar with that sure. particular role? Yeah, totally. So these are you know all these agencies are huge bureaucracies, and the typical structure is you have a secretary, and then you have an undersecretary who would be like a chief operating officer in a big corporation. And then under that, you have department heads and like the, the so Homeland Security has uh, ICE and, uh, and uh, Customs and Border Patrol CBP and they have uh, a science director and they have, um, so they have like, I've forgotten how many there are now, maybe as many as 10 or 12. Um, and each of these is like uh, an assistant secretary for whatever, except in the case of ICE and CBP, you know, Customs and uh, Immigration. Um, they actually are commissioners, so they have a, a title uh, that is somewhat like the title I had, except they're not independent. Uh, they still report up the chain of command through the, the undersecretary and sometimes their deputy secretaries. Um, uh, and by the way, kind of the old rule in Washington is the longer your title, the lower you are. So <laughs> <laughs> like the special assistant to the deputy undersecretary of whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Make it means you are a, a no one. But the chief of staff, they all have someone to kind of run the office policy side. So you have a policy shop and, a, and someone in, uh, who's an assistant secretary for that. Um, but someone has to be there and really kind of coordinate everything that goes on. The secretary's schedule, uh, who he sees, um, his speeches. Uh, often they, they have, they're in charge of speech writing. They frequently have um, you know, they are the last guy to have control over who sees them and who gets in and out. Um, so a chief of staff can be a very, very powerful position in an agency. And, and you know, I had one and even on a small staff, um, you, you want someone who you, can you turn around to and say, take care of this. And, and you really have to trust them. And they, by the way, know everything you know, typically. So he, yes, he was a senior administration official. It wasn't just a benefit to the New York Times to call him that or whoever, you know, whoever wrote, I forgot whether he did in the Times or the Post, but, and, um, and then later, of course, when he wrote his book, you know, it was appropriate for him to call himself a senior administration official. So, um, so this is one of those kind of silly swamp nits, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the reason they're doing it is they're trying to undermine his credibility. Well, he's a credible guy. Um, every chief of staff knows every other chief of staff and believe me, they all talk. Sure. And, and they, and they, you know, he goes out drinking with his friends, you know, he's a young guy. Uh, uh, I don't know if he's married or whatever, but you know, if he's, so there's a whole layer of people like him who are loyal, but they're also concerned. And part of their job is to keep people out of trouble, not to get them into trouble. Um, <laughs> I'm watching this great um, Netflix show now called, Oregon. 
And it, it's, it's about the Danish government and a woman, the first woman prime minister and all, all the politics. And, you know, there it's very different. Uh, uh, the chief of staff is, in fact, virtually everybody who works for her is a, a professional civil servant. So talk right. about the swamp. Um, and she has her own uh, cabinet officials, but they're all members of other parties to form a government. And, you know, that's the way it is in all parliamentary democracies. It's like that in, in England and all the rest. It's a great show, by the way. I would definitely recommend it. Uh, if you like politics, it's great. Um, if you like um, character development, it's it's terrific, um, and believe me, it's a mile a minute twists and turns. But but it is the ultimate idea of a swamp. In the U.S., most of these positions I've forgotten how many we still have left. There used to be four or five thousand positions in what was called the plum book, uh, <laughs> which is when a president came in, he got to appoint all these people, and only a handful of them had to be uh, confirmed by the. Uh, uh, Congress by the Senate. And that number had been sto- steadily whittled down. But positions like chief of staffs, they're loyalty positions. So, right. They're not, they're not permanent positions versus... Not permanent. He's, yeah. he's out of here the day uh, the next president comes in, even if it's a Republican, the odds are he's out of here. And, and just, or he would have been if he were still on the job. Yeah. To illustrate that here in Indiana, when the, when it went from the Mitch Daniels administration, who is a Republican, to the Mike Pence administration. There was a large number of Republicans that quit, resigned, wouldn't work for Mike Pence. Mike yeah. Pence didn't want them to work for him because they were too liberal or not ideologically right enough. And so yeah. there was a large amount of turnover in a lot of those agency head positions. But then there was also a filling of what I would call the American civil service positions. Like, you know, our buddy Rob Kendall ended up working, um, you know, as like on the insurance commission, you know, yeah. Rob's a talk radio show host working for the insurance commission, but he had knocked on doors and needed a job. And so the Pence administration yeah. appointed him to the insurance commission. So, you know, there, there's jobs like that, but he could have had that job for 20 years had he wanted to stay in it. Yeah. You know, th- there well, is there a lot, lot of things like that in government, you know, and, and, you know, the other phenomenon you see, and this is where the swamp really becomes swampy, is administrations, basically, you may be a political appointee, but you what you do is you want to uh, burrow in if you want to stay, because right. nothing like getting your 20 years in a pension and uh, when you get out. And some people just like it. I have, I, I must say, I probably have 20 friends who burrowed in, you know, way back, all the way far, as far back as probably Ford, you know, 40 years ago. And certainly some from the Bush, first Bush, and certainly many from the second Bush, and I know others from the, all the administration, they burrow in and become civil servants. And so. Yeah, I really, like, I know a lot of center-right people won't look at a, a John Bolton interview or a My- Miles Taylor interview, or I forget the uh, the lady who uh, is also part of this, uh, t- speaking out about the administration. Like, but well, if you the, read. Yeah, the young woman. Yeah. yeah, if you read these books, if you read, if you listen in these interviews, you get a great education. Like when Bolton, when he talked to the Bulwark podcast, Bolton gave you a great explanation of the rise of a career of a civil servant like John Bolton and all the places he worked and how he, how he had moved up the ladder and who he had talked to and how these meetings run. Like you really do, exposing yourself to the information does not mean that you're going to end up agreeing with liking for or wanting to vote the same way as John Bolton. Yeah. Just information Although that you Bolton, take in. I, th- I, th- I think Bolton was large, has largely been in political positions, certainly for the last 20 years. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, and many start as, as, um, as a civil servant and, and this start of course, on a campaign is the, and then you get appointed. Yeah. And of course this is the crux of this, you know, we talk about the swamp. What is the swamp? I, I, I meant to do a little research and see who first, um, you know, called it the swamp. And the next time we get together, maybe I'll have that. Um, but, but uh, you know, the, the swamp is sometimes people think of it as the professionals who are there for 10, 20, 30 years, come thick or thin, high, you know, Republican or Democrat. Sometimes it's, it's, the, it's not the civil service. It's the, the lobbyists who have similar careers through, through the thick and thin and, you know, the yin and yang of all these administrations. And, and sometimes they, they mean the money that they throw around and sometimes they mean the politicians. So the swamp has all sorts of layers of 
of uh, professionals. You know, this is, and it's uh, frankly, it's a classic uh, American political argument uh, where people think they don't want politicians. They, you know, so-called career politicians, but, but do they want a career doctor? Or they want a career right. uh, uh, dentist? Or they want a, you know, a career pilot? Or, and, and politics is a profession. And, um, and, and the people in the civil service typically are people who have learned what it is they're supposed to do. And that many have taken advanced degrees and many write about this and they, they go through professional societies just like other people in other professions. And, um, you know, they, they, they do their job. And, and you and I have talked on numerous occasions that where Trump has failed most mightily is in failing to appoint people who could represent his point of view and, and make his imprint on government. Um, you know, there are tons, there are hundreds of these, or there have been hundreds of these civil service, of these uh, uh, political appointee jobs left open. And, and you cannot make your imprint unless you put the, the professional politician or the political representative of the president at the top of an agency. And that's his big failure. If, if, if the next president who wants to deal with the swamp and bend it to his will, is going to do that. And believe and me, it's, you, it's gonna be Biden, ideological. he will do it. He, he will do it. He knows where to find the swamp yeah. creature. And he's going to, uh, it, it is. Some of them he the, likes and some of them he doesn't. It's just like all of us, you know? Yes. I, I have struggled with this this kind of topic my entire career because when I started as a baby radio producer with Abdul, who is Indiana, Indiana Swamp to the T, you know, he, <laughs> he would always argue with me saying, you want a professional legislator legislature that is full time because you you need lobbyists, you need all these professionals because they understand how this works. And, you know, it's similar to what you've seen, you know, your high school epidemiology, your high school friends and epidemiologist on Facebook. Well, as a person who's been around politics my entire life, I see what people say and it's totally detached from anything that anyone who's worked in politics experiences. So it's yeah. Sort of like there's a lot in politics, like it, when when somebody's watching a football game and they think they could be head coach better than the head coach. Right. Meanwhile, they haven't spent 75 hours a week in a tape room making decisions, working with people on these. But their gut instinct tells them that they'd be better than the coach. And that right. that's one of the disconnects that I think with libertarians a lot of times is if you get elected, you are now in a world where you're dealing with these people. Like we have a, a gubernatorial candidate here who has a real shot to win in a three way race. What happens if he wins? Because the majority of the people that are driving him to victory are largely disconnected and unknowledgeable about the tasks that they would undertake if they got elected to office. Right. And there is no incentive for anyone to learn because the populist streak within the libertarian movement means if you do a show like we do, you're going to get killed because you're liberal or you're big. You're sta it's like, no, I'm trying to help you understand how this stuff works so you can actually change it as opposed to just screaming because that's not going to, that's not going to change well, it. So you know, a yeah. big disconnect between how government functions and what we, how we talk about it. Well, and I think there's a disconnect between um, our, our own personal expectations and how we feel about other people and the way government has to function too. You know, it's been, you know, it's always compared to making sausage. You, you don't want to see how sausage is made. You don't want to see how politics is made. And politics is the art of the possible. And, yeah. uh, you know, I was just thinking as we're talking about this, one of the interesting experiments in this it was uh, Macron's government. He, he came, essentially, he created his own party. He brought in a lot of young people who had never been in government, uh, who got elected to the parliament. And, uh, and by and large, he's kept them in the fold. And but, uh, you know, that starts to, they would start to be nibbled away at the edges as they find out they have to make this compromise or that compromise. And, um, and of course, he's, I, he's gone up and down in, in the popular polls and all that. But he is, he is a living experiment in bringing in people who've never been involved in government into the legislature. So, and, and it's just, it's hard. Um, it would be nice if you had some regular replacement. You and I both know that in the Congress, some 90%, 90 plus percent of the congressmen are reelected. 
the number yeah. who change is is you can count them on one or two hands every election, uh, it, unless you have one of these major cycle, you know, uh, you know, blowout kind of election, um, and where you lose 20, 30 seats and all that. But um, well, did it you happen very often? Did you see the swamp on HBO? It was a documentary about Matt Gates and Thomas Massey. And it was a great illustration. Like I, I, I give the benefit of the doubt to MAGA land in them saying they want to drain the swamp. And a guy like Matt Gates, uh, you, you, you find him so much more likable as a regular human being instead of a screaming mouthpiece on cable news. And he's lying to people because that's what the people want. That's what they want to hear. Uh, but I think he genuinely believes in reform to kind of drain the swamp, whereas, t but he's willing to play the game and bamboozle people. But then you look at Thomas Massey, who's not, and he's not willing to do the work that he hates. And he's, you know, mm -hmm. always in trouble with his caucus. And so I, I think the MAGA world is a great example of a group of people who are ideological about certain things. But then once they get a taste of power, they get into Washington, D.C., You've got a whole new swamp created of all these people trying yeah. to sucker people out of their money, and you end up <laughs> the, the last three Trump campaign managers getting arrested. So, so the only answer is that the swamp is everyone else, right? <laughs> Which right. is true. Which, and you know, and again, as I've said time, time again, I am so glad on some days that the civil service is there. They get out the Social Security checks and the Medicare payments and uh, they they make sure the defense programs function and the and you know the they the borders more or less operate and this goes and that goes and, and you're a small always, c you're a small c conservative you institutions are necessary for yeah totally in well, middle change and lack of chaos yeah I, I i i like lack of chaos and i do think as we move, go into this election on tuesday i do think that's going to be you know, what, what is the real driver for people's votes? You know, you and I have not yet talked about the election. And, you know, we both woke up this morning to two new polls, one in Florida and one in Pennsylvania. Uh, I, as I was saying to you earlier, the, the, uh, the uh, Washington Post says uh, Biden leads slightly in Pennsylvania with Florida toss-up polls show. Well, it, it, it's only like a half a point difference in who leads where. So it, yeah. it should have said Biden leads marginally in Pennsylvania, Trump leads marginally in Florida. Yeah. Um, still, some I interesting undecideds in some of these places. I, uh, I think that uh, I'm having a hard time for the first time, kind of calling an election. I, my instinct is that, uh, I mean, yesterday uh, before this poll came out, I thought, well, Florida was gradually moving into Biden's camp. Now, um, and this morning, I, I'm thinking, well, hmm, maybe not, and. But the big question is, and this is the big, big problem for all the polling guys, is most of the country has voted already. And they yeah. voted as far back as three weeks ago on issues that were salient to them three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, the market was up. Two weeks ago, it was down. This week, you know, GDP is way up. Um, so if you're voting today and you're voting on economic issues, which, by the way, is what is the main driver of most people's votes, um, consumer confidence is up at 54% or something like that. It was it's the, been a little bit. The Gallup you know? poll that said 60 yeah. some percent of people were better off today than they were yeah. four years yeah. ago in the middle of a Back recession. to the Reagan thing. Right. Absolutely. So it, I think it's going to be very hard. And I, the, you know, kudos to whatever pollster is figuring out how to sample the people who've already voted and where they're landing. I have not seen anywhere any analysis of that. Um, well, but, and you know, Texas is already more people have voted in Texas absentee or, or early than voted in 2016, which was a blowout. So. Yeah, there's a probably by the time we record this on Sunday, November 1st, uh, about 100 million will have voted earlier absentee. We're right at 100. Yeah. And then another 50 million will vote on Tuesday. You know, that's a large chunk of people. And I, I do think that Ann Selzer is one of the most reliable pollsters in Iowa. Yeah, she's she basically. Great showed this massive shift, the seven point shift towards Trump in Iowa, which is kind of something that I think is we're seeing here in Indiana in this governor's race with the Republican governor shedding 15 percent. There's two central questions. The main central question of this election is, can you stomach four more years of Donald Trump? Right. And the second question is, what do you think about lockdowns and who's going to prevent more lockdowns? I think the lockdowns are the wild card in this. And if mm -hmm. Donald Trump 
does win, despite all the thousands of polls showing he has no shot, it, it is the last minute expansion of COVID and the resentment and fear of lockdowns that that will drive people towards him. But you're right. There's 100 million people that have voted. How- well, and 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 I, I, I don't I, I would not say I today would still not say that Trump will not win. OK, um, I uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, I thought I thought it was trending towards Biden. And I think Biden's momentum, if you look at the polling data, is actually, you know, he's actually the gap is narrowing, which it always does. You know, the public, once they have to make a choice, they make a choice. I, I will not be surprised if uh, the third party candidates do better than is predicted right now. I think there are going to be a number of people going into the polling booth on Tuesday. They're going to say, ah, geez, I just cannot stomach this guy. And I don't want to vote for the other one. And so I, I actually think that will go up. And if that happens, that's bad for Biden. You know, that was bad for Hillary. That lost her the election, uh, ultimately. So, but uh, boy, this map, looking at it, is really phenomenal. And uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Texas goes. You know, Texas had, uh, I think, what was the number? Two million or a million and a half new residents since uh, the last election four years ago. Um, it's huge. And um, people are moving into Arizona, a ton, ton of people there. Florida had Georgia. You know, nearly a million. Georgia, yeah, I, you know, I'm listening to the mayor of, uh, of uh, Raleigh-Durham uh, the other uh, yesterday, and she, they, they had a hundred and some thousand, if I recall, in there. And so uh, the people moving are moving into areas which are urban, and they are, uh, te- many are technologists uh, and professionals, and, and uh, by and large, they're coming out of the Midwest and, and off the coast and other places. And I, I don't think that that helps Trump particularly, you know. Well, he so. has to win. So for Trump to win, he has to win the states he won last time. He has right. to win. Well, he can, he can lose too. Okay. So he, he, but he definitely needs to win either Florida or Pennsylvania, I think. Yeah. And I, I, I think the, the, his best bet is still, uh, um, is, is still Michigan, um, still uh, I, today, I'd say Florida um, wouldn't be surprised on Pennsylvania. I don't. I think Pennsylvania seems to be narrowing. Uh, I think Pennsylvania because it has the largest number of white working class without a college degree, which he does really well in. You've got the riots in Philadelphia happening again. Right. You've got right. the oil comments. I could see Philadelphia. I could see Pennsylvania flipping very easily. I could see seniors are most impacted by both. The pandemic and lockdowns. Right. You know, my my grandfather, as I've mentioned on the show, is in a nursing home, and and so is my grandmother. But he, you know, she's she's in memory care, and he is, his life is just turned upside down. You know, right. and you can't and I, go visit him, can you? Uh, you you can now sit across the table, but that's probably going to change. You know what I mean? Like, and I even though the the facility is making that call, not anyone in government. There's still, I think, going to be some part of people that go, you know, I'm in this horrible situation and Biden's probably going to make this worse. So I'm going to vote for the anti-lockdown candidate, which is Trump. And I could see that plus the economic stuff tightening a lot of these things in places like Florida, despite the fact that Donald Trump, you know, as a polling last week in, in the senior category he was he won it by 17 points in 2016 he's now only winning it by two in whites in a cnn poll two days ago he won whites across the nation by 20 points he's now only winning it by two you know so you you see these little signs of of it tightening but i I, does he win arizona florida pennsylvania north carolina georgia michigan all these i i was done he's won that ohio yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Ohio's that, dropped out of the conversation. I, I um, you know, it's it's clear that Pennsylvania, Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, Arizona are the guys. Um, yeah. Now the I, Trump's I, campaign says they're they're gearing up in Nevada, Pennsylvania, right, right. and Florida for litigation. Right. Well, they're going to litigate everywhere. Well, the good thing, the good thing, if there is anything good about most of this, is that. Uh, I mean, it's great if you're a political watcher, like you. I'm, I'm having, I'm having, fascinating. I'm having the time of my life. I don't know about you. <laughs> no, it's no. fascinating, and and uh, we're actually doing with our small pod of of six friends a an election eve 
thing at my house. I've, I've just gotten five HEPA filter machines and, and <laughs> I just bought a, you know, an outdoor heater and hopefully I'll have dinner outside and I'm going to have the, the, I've got a six foot, you know, TV. I've got a huge TV. And of course I'll be watching. And my wife says, nobody else wants to watch it. You'll just have to report us. We'll be drinking. <laughs> and of course I'll be drinking, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, uh, where, where was I? I can't remember where I was going on that, but, um, the, um, it's just how, it, how the lockdowns, I, a, a lot of this yeah, is what's going to affect it. Trump's messaging and he's running a very online campaign talking about people like Miles Taylor that nobody, nobody cares about Hunter Biden. Like people didn't, you tell me, but people didn't care about Billy Carter. They didn't care about, you know, yeah, I I still have my Billy Carter beer, right? They don't care about (laughs) Hunter Biden. That's stuff that Republicans care about. But what they care about is how they're personally affected. Am I going to recover from this economically better with Trump or Biden? Who's going to lock me down, even though neither has the power to do it? And then, you know, they, it, it's me, me, me. It's sort of how to, yeah, has yeah. it affected. And so yeah, I don't, yeah. it, and largely it just comes down to who do you, who do you coalition with? Are you right or are you left? And I think there's, I think, just think there's more people on center left in this country. And I just can't see him statistically running the table like he needs to. I, I don't think it's impossible. I do think it's. I mean, Trump, you know, Trump running the table. Yeah, I don't think yeah. it's possible that, that. Um, Impossible. I think he's got some latitude. I think last time you and I got on, they, the the post had just published their uh, their model where you can and and I I I suggest people go and I think you may have put it on the website of uh, where you can pick states to go one way or another and 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 pick your own path. I, I think people should be doing that because I think I do it election eve and I I'd, I'd be doing it now if you are taking bets. Two seventy uh, to win is a great website. Seventy to win. That's right. The um, I think the other interesting so so. You know, the things that make this a difficult election um, are shifting populations, shifting demographics. You know, people think of, Lat- many people think of Latinos as a single-minded entity, but you have Cuban Americans who uh, tend to vote Republican, although they're less Republican than they used to be. You have, um, in Florida, you have, I think it's the largest Puerto Rican population uh, in anywhere, including Puerto Rico or New York in um, North and Central Florida. And mm-hmm. they tend to vote Democratic, uh, although um, less so now, you know, as they become more business centric. Venezuelan um, population. Venezuelan, well, the Venezuelan population doesn't typically vote, but they're noisy in Florida. You have Salvadorians mm-hmm. who've been there a long time who do vote. They have, a, they have very mixed interests. Um, and then, of course, out in the West, you have uh, Mexican-Americans and, and uh, in addition to some of these others. And and they have a variety of things. And you know, one of the, you and I both know the polls are showing that Latinos as a group, uh, Latino men and um, and black men uh, are actually Trump has made you know some some gains there, like two or three, four percent um, in what he did in 2016. So that's interesting. Although he's of course losing more and more among women and white women and and educated and so on and so forth. What I have not heard. What I'm not hearing that I heard in abundance in 2016 is, uh, I said my brother, for example, began the election by saying, um, I would never vote for Trump. He's a lifelong Republican like me. And he ended the election with, I would never vote for Hillary. So, you know, Trump Mm -hmm. managed to make it about Hillary more than about himself. And I am not hearing a similar thing now Although Trump is banging on Biden and the Democrats as socialists and communists, which has some salience, you know, to the Cuban community, but not as much as it used to. You know, we're under the fifth generation of Cubans here. And yeah. and my friends who in that community, by and large, are much more liberal than their parents and 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 uh, and uh, they are further away. Although, you know, there's I think some of them have. They're, they're, they're now trying to grab their roots back. And some of them don't speak Spanish anymore. Uh, and they, they want their kids to do that. And so it's, it's very interesting. I think when all is said and done, though, um, I, I, I would give a slight edge to Biden. Um, I, think, I think based on the early vote, I guess I would probably say Trump will probably not win Florida, but it will be called early because Florida has been counting ballots 
Um, I, if I recall correctly, I think North Carolina has been counting ballots. North Carolina is going to be very interesting. Um, I think I think the, the race with Lindsey Graham is going to be that's going to be a nail biter. Um, yeah, uh, I think, uh, and we have a bunch of Senate races like that. I, I unfortunately, I, I, I think Susan Collins is going to lose. You know, one of the ill effects of this kind of polarization is that the moderates, the centrists in both parties, end up being kicked out. So, so it gets harder and harder to actually get anything done in Washington and and in the swamp, if you want to call it that. Um, when there there are few people in the middle, you know, the, the alternative is the Tom Cottons of the world who is a brilliant guy, but he, uh, he's an uncompromising, you know, guy. And, uh, and so, so looking at this, yeah, uh, I hope. Terrible. <laughs> I, I, I think Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley are the worst. Uh, yeah, I, I too, like I, if you're, I had high hopes, but I, I think they're the worst. I like, I like, you know, Ben, uh, 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 Sass in Nebraska, but you know, he's, he, I think he's lost his, his uh, determination, notwithstanding yeah. his reaction, you know, the other, you know, we talked about it last time and, and uh, there's a, it's going to be hard. There's a great website called isidewith.com where you can kind of see who you, you coalition with the best and you take this quiz and I am, as most libertarians ought to be, they're on the opposite end of big government liberalism, active intervention into the economy and intervention across the seas. I don't see any difference between Tom Cotton, Josh Hawley, and Hillary Clinton. They may say, <laughs> oh, we're for limited government, but like they're they're basically on that same spectrum as Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton in terms of the government can do good things for you, and it's all about intervening in personal and military lives. But so when you look at the Senate race, the Senate map, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, Senate you got, doesn't look good for Republicans. It, it, it started out looking good, and, and, and you touched it started, on it. Yeah, I agree with that. You... you you know, you had in 2016 Donald Trump promising things. And we always talk about how the public loves free stuff, right? You were going to get a wall. You were going to get Supreme Court justices. The Mexican Supreme Court going to pay for it. Right. right. You know what you're getting this time is you're going to get four more years of outrage at the people that personally offend Donald Trump. He's going to hate on Leslie Stahl. He's going to hate on – there's not really much in terms of – for those independent voters, if you are in that 43% of the country that lives for outrage at – hypocrisy then donald trump's your guy but what do you do with that other 57 percent? you know that you've got to do something to kind of break out of that uh yep. and he's dragging yep. the senate you know there there's no reason that john cornyn in texas and montana and the two seats in georgia and tom tillis in north carolina they shouldn't be in play but they're in play because the top of the ticket has no real closing message. They've never really defined Joe Biden in any way. And you're right. If he had stuck to he's a big government pro lockdown, high taxation candidate, the economy's better under me. And he had just beaten that drum. If Trump had been disciplined from the beginning, this would be a much different race than Leslie Stahl was mean to me. Right. Hunter Biden. You well, know, yeah, that yeah, stuff yeah, just yeah. doesn't work. It's he 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 failed and he's they're going to end up, in my opinion, the Democrats are going to take 51 to 53 seats because across the board and all those down ticket races. There's no reason that in Indiana, Dan Burton's seat in the fifth district is going to go to a Democrat. And within that district is the Indiana Speaker of the House's district. And he's going mm -hmm. to it's going to flip and he may lose. Yeah. Like that. Well, so what like you're predicting in some ways is a down ballot route. Um, and yeah. again, I would not be surprised about that. And, and you and I have talked about uh, targeting of um, the, the, the second tier targeting. It's not just Senate and Senate races per se and House broadly in the presidency, but there's this, there are like 10 or 12 congressional seats that are really important to flip um, uh, delegations for redistricting which will happen yeah. right after the end here. And, you know, the Democrats enjoyed a redistricting advantage for about 60 years. And then Republicans have gradually gotten it over the last 30 years. And, and I think it's probably going to flip back. And, and they really punished the, the Republicans punished them 10 years ago. And that's absolutely. why they've done really well. And I cannot stress if you are a Republican listening to this program, you should be so furious with your party because they have yeah, put yeah. you in such a poor disadvantage for redistricting in the next 10 years by holding on to Donald Trump, who is 
personally out for Donald Trump and not for your collective interest. I, I never understand the, 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 uh, the cult like following this guy has built because he's so like Lindsey Graham is just hung out to dry. He hasn't campaigned with Lindsey Graham once. Like yeah. what? Yeah. And Lindsey Graham has been hanging on to him. Like, you know, you know this is long locks brother. He is, he's Bobsy twins or something. Well, it, yeah. So if you, but you raised something earlier, which I think is an important question, which is um, when it's over, What's it going to be like? And what would you do if you were, let's say, a Biden or a Trump? Um, first of all, I don't think it's going to be like if, if Biden loses, I don't think it's going to be like 2016, where you had just this fervor, particularly among many women, for Hillary Clinton. Uh, and uh, she, she had a real following. Uh, Biden is, and, and the first woman kind of thing, Biden is uh, just a, He's a politician. He's experienced. He's, you know, he's not flashy. Um, I, I don't his think he'll be a boring campaign where he hit, hit out in the basement. It's, I think it's, work. it's great. He, it's what you he never do. came he out. He he pissed off the far right and far left by never coming out and saying what he stood for. Right. Because and, no and, one could define him. And and is he's boring. And that's why his favorables are at 52 percent. And Hillary's were at 40. But if he loses, but if he loses, um, I don't think you will have the phenomenon you had after Hillary lost, which is this total non-acceptance of the election results. Um, you know, I have said numerous times on the show that I think in many respects, Donald Trump has the right to be constantly pissed off because he, he was never accepted um, early on. You know, you had a, a Democratic congresswoman calling for his impeachment before he was ever sworn in. This is true, not, not apocryphal. Al Green, um, uh, and um, and you have people who have been against him from the beginning. He is right. The press has been against him from the beginning. Um, he you know he used the press, but now the press and the press made him. But he has never had a favorable press for just about anything. And and you know I had an interesting exchange with a friend of mine the other day via text, and she was saying, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "Well." You know, there are some good things. There are things, there are some things which, that he has done that I think are good. But he is just such an overwhelming jackass. And I personally can't take what he, he, he says about the military and soldiers. You know, you know, why are these guys stupid or, or whatever for going over to fight? And, and, um, and so I'm not going to vote for him. And, you know, I've said it before, even though I'm a lifelong Republican. But, um, and she said, I've, I've just been waiting for you to tell me that. And she's she's a much more conservative Republican than I am. And so I think if, if there are people, you know, the, the 30 percent of the public that's going to vote on Tuesday, um, I think they're going to come down to. How am I doing? That's great. I'm doing fine. But gee whiz, do I want four more years of this just constant, constant, constant yeah. bickering and dissonance? And if Biden wins, then the question is, how will he reach out? But yes, how will Trump react? But how will he reach out? Can he reach out um, to these disaffected voters? And, you know, a lot of them voted, many of them voted for Obama. So he can remind them of that. Um, but I'm not, you know, I, I think if Trump wins, he's definitely not going to reach out. But if he were to win, I would not be surprised if he abandoned um, the, the Trumpistas in the party on some issues. You know, I think fundamentally he has no, um, no uh, ideology or political philosophy. So he, then he'll want to do deals. And maybe Trump unleashed, <laughs> I hate to use that term, might produce some things that are good. Um, but I, 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 I just think don't. The press will be way against him. And then, of course, he's trying to build a dynasty. You know, his kids, yeah. you know, Don Jr. and yeah, Ivanka has all of a sudden we now see has become pro-life um, and uh, the, the smarmy answered the, the other day and I've forgotten who did the interview, but probably Fox. So, uh, it, yeah. Uh, so here's my here's my counter to almost all. So let's say you know, Trump wins. Right. Trump, as Jonah Goldberg pointed out, and I would I would kind of put you and I in kind of the center right bulwark yeah. dispatch kind of crowd, and that's why right. we have an aversion to Donald Trump, but we definitely aren't pro Biden, you know, like in the way that those guys are because of basically big government liberalism and interventionism. Right. But you know, 
you're right that Trump never got a fair shake. And I think he has every right to be upset about that, but he never helped himself. And I treat no. Donald Trump like I would treat totally. any other human being. I don't see him as supernatural. Right. You know, he, he had the opportunity. Uh, now, I'm not arguing for this as a policy point of view. I'm saying this is what Bannon proposed. Do an infrastructure bill as your first act. Yes. Build a, a bridge, a coalition, you know, spend money in every, every district. So for four years, you fly in there and go, I built you that bridge. You know, but his instinct was to continue to fight the Russiagate stuff, to litigate that. And he's <laughs> right. Robert. He strides and affected all that into an existence and, and finally gave them something to impeach him on. He didn't by, by focusing on that solely. He hurt himself. Yes. I don't think that condition is going to change. Day one, if he wins, they're going to try and impeach him on something else. And he's going to give it to him because he can't anything that Donald Trump, as Goldberg pointed out the other day, anything that Donald Trump didn't have involvement in succeeded and it's the stuff that conservatives like most of that was because of paul ryan and mitch mcconnell and the mm -hmm. the adults in the room around him you know the mcmasters and and the boltons and the people that he hates everything that donald trump did poorly on like covid he had a personal hand in and so now who is going to go work for him in a second term you're not going to get adults you're going to get grifters you're going to get People like the guy that just got ushered out of, you know, that we talked about that was doing all these weird streams and, you know, all the best to his health. But you're, you're, you're not going to get effective people in a second term. You're just going to get more of what Donald Trump wants, which is you talking about Donald Trump, right. which, you know, and if Joe Biden wins, Joe Biden for a a brief period will have 60 percent of this country kind of go like they did with Donald Trump. I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to let's just see how he goes, does as president. But the second he rolls out some big environmental policy or big health care policy or whatever, you're going to have Tea Party 2.0. You're going to have a realignment. You're also going to have well, and we could use that. And we could that. Absolutely. I, I think when you look at Joe Biden as president, he's going to be a lame duck from day one. He's going to be attacked by all the wings of his party because they want the 2024 nomination. You're going to have them eating each other. You're going to have the Republicans eating each other, you know, Trump winning is only going to probably divide the party and will kill off the libertarian streak and the Republicans. So I, I, I'm not as panicked about a Biden presidency because I see it as as disruptive as a Trump presidency in a lot of ways. I, I would give you that. I agree with all that. And, and by the way, the infrastructure bill, I, I don't disagree with anything you said. Um, I, I th the, but the infrastructure bill, for example, is a very good example of the party swamp um, uh, uh, dealing him a, a bad hand. So, you know, Mitch McConnell didn't really want to do that. And Elaine Chao, Secretary of Transportation, really didn't want to do that. Right. And, and, and you know, this is where the kind of the, the old fashioned, um, we can't blow the budget stuff, um, <laughs> you know, the short term. The short-term vision versus the long-term. Um, anybody with a jot of intelligence knows that if you rebuild infrastructure, you're going to have instant hits in the economy, and and it's going to instantly improve the. It's like infrastructures like oil, in Greece, not oil, big oil like Greece, in in making the moving parts move faster. And this this is where yeah, if there were one thing he could have done to to make himself a president who who was president and to knock everybody off on their butt, that would have been infrastructure. Nobody but he, expected. But he lost that he lost. to the Republican swamp. And yeah, he, no nobody one else can be blamed. Can be blamed. Donald, I never thought Donald Trump was a libertarian. He was a Democrat two weeks before. No, he, you know, yeah. he, wanted a, he wanted a bigger stimulus bill than, than Pelosi did in that first round. You know, he's, he's, uh, libertarians would have hated Donald Trump and then, you know, a portion of them would have found a way to love him because of non-interventionism. Because their check was big you know, enough. I, well, the non-interventionism is a big thing. Anybody else would have been applauded for it, that. It is. And, and, uh, but he and, should and, be. Yeah. And then, of course, the foreign policy swamp is yet another, the establishment. And um, everybody's wringing their hands, but they've stopped wringing their hands. I, I think if Biden wins, however, he's got a huge, huge opportunity. Um, he will have all of these countries in on there, you know, under the thumb of tariffs, and he can pull the thumb up gradually or quickly. He can make deals. Um, he's got. Uh, he'll be able to do the stimulus bill if the Congress doesn't do it first. Um, 
And so he'll have a gas, you know, the, the pushing the pedal down there for the economy. Um, and um, uh, I think he has a lot of opportunities and I, I think his instincts are not radical. Um, uh, yeah. But so I, you know, the left is going to be disappointed on some things, but I think, yeah, you will, there'll be more environmental stuff. That's fine. And, and uh, yeah, there'll be more climate stuff. There should be more climate stuff. I mean, this is, there's bound to be a way to, to deal with that. I'm, I'm one of these people who thinks, well, even if it's, if, even if it's not human cause, there are things you can see and do something about. So do something about it. And um, uh, so, you know, it'll be, I don't think it'd be radical per se, but I do agree with you that it can be a, it will be a, it, it can be a big administration and big change, and it will cause ripples in both parties. I think uh, I am not well, sanguine that Republicans will regroup intelligently, um, uh, but I can say, and you you would say the same, come 2024, it's going to be a, a riot of candidates. Because Oh, Biden's yeah. I mean, the most, the most important election of your lifetime begins on Wednesday. I think it, it all depends on how much you, uh, how much Biden wins by d- determines how revolutionary this administration would yeah. be. So if you look at the historical precedent, you look at 88 or, or, or 92, I mean, when Clinton wins, it's by one to two points. He's now constrained and does a lot of conservative things because he was in a conservative position. Uh, you look at 80, well, Reagan could do a lot more because he won by three to five points and he had more of a mandate. Then you look at 32 when Roosevelt wins by seven, eight points. Right. Then it's Roosevelt, for God's sake. So, you know, yeah. the, the, the mandate stuff and the license, you know, and, and then not to mention, let's say they have 57 seats in the Senate. It's a total blowout and, and it's a big blue wave. And Biden has eight point, an eight point win, 400 electoral college votes. 57 Senate seats, almost a majority in the House. Well, you know, that that's <laughs> that is a terrifying prospect. And so I do think that fear is going to kind of limit him to one one to two points. Yeah. I think yeah. Biden, I think the math for Trump, it's not impossible, but it's really hard. And I think people are just exhausted with him. I think there's yeah. a lot of conservatives. Yeah. I think they're when yeah, you I look at the X. That, that go, yes. we got Amy yeah. Coney Barrett, we got three, he did his job. I'm just tired of defending him. Yeah, I think, and, and by the way, speaking of Barrett, um, I've been thinking about this too. My, my prediction is if the Democrats win, I, I would not be surprised if they added two seats to the Supreme Court, but more likely what they should do is add more seats to the appellate level and to the level below that. Uh, because, you know, we've added, the Republican side and the conservatives have added I don't know, 170, some huge number of judges. And I think the Democrats, as soon as they get in, they're going to realize that what that strategy was and the courts are continually uh, overutilized. So they're going to add another layer to that, which is what they should do. If they, yeah, so they have more judges to a point. I agree because the court packing thing in terms of the Supreme Court is a non-starter because yeah, you have to hard. a you have to fight for two to four months to kill the filibuster. Then you got to get two thirds. Where they're going to end the filibuster. filibuster? Yeah, and then you've got to, but then you've got to, you've got, to, you've got basically a two long year fight, and you're going to suck up all the oxygen that keeps you from doing anything that you promised that you were going to do. Nobody's run on it. Nobody's saying that they're going to do this. It's just kind of a liberal scare tactic that I don't. Oh, you know, conservative scare tactic too. Like I just don't, I don't see the the court packing thing happening because there there's you don't like, see, why see the Supreme I, Court packing happening. Right. Happening. I think your scenario is much more likely. That right. makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that's sort of out of sight, out of mind. By the way. So. Right. Way. Yeah. And this is the uh, caravan of this is the caravan of of 2020. Like as soon right. as the election o- is over, the caravan disappeared. So will court packing. <laughs> well. So, so uh, it's uh, the it's ticking towards us, isn't it? It. I know. I'm sort of sad that it's going to disappear. It's been a lot of fun. What a crazy year! You know, it's <laughs> going to be a long, dark winter without all the arguments that we have. Uh, do Do you think that? Um, let me ask you this uh, quickly before we go on. But do you think there will be violence from either side? And do you think there will be a long contracted court fight? Or do you think it's going to be, I think it's, I, I don't see either taking place, but I'm interested in your perspective. Um, 
I thought Florida was more likely to be very clear than I think it is now. Right now, I am not sure Florida is going to be clear. Although, if the polling now is uh, uh, Trump slightly ahead, that mainly only refers to in-person voters coming up in Tuesday. So, uh, the Democrats really did their job earlier, and uh, that's why I think Florida is probably still likely to go for Biden this time marginally. Um, and if that's the case, uh, Florida will be harder to challenge, but I, I expect a challenge. Um, I, I think uh, a couple of these other states are going to be a little more difficult. Um, I don't expect Trump to concede on election eve, uh, I, uh, unless some massive, massive, massive route that we're not predicting right now happens. And I do think that um, there will be litigation. And but I don't think it will change the outcome. I think the key states are, are gonna be the ones we know. It's gonna be Michigan, Florida, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Arizona. And uh, I think Arizona, if I had to lay money on it right now, I'd probably say Arizona is gonna go for Biden as well. Um, and so that's the nail in the coffin. So, so I, I, I expect to see you know, some lawsuits for a couple of weeks. Um, I, I, I also expect some violence, I'm, honestly. Chris, I think, uh, you know, on both sides, if, if Biden were to lose, if, if Trump is to lose, you're going to see it. It's going to depend entirely on the candidates. It's going to, uh, now, uh, Biden can't control Antifa, uh, but Trump can control his people. So I expect he violence. Anyone he, violence. he tweeted Anyone. the video no, yesterday no. saying, well, go Texas. The bus. Oh, the geez. Bus. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, t joking last week about Biden being assassinated and Kamala coming in and the crowd like just like went silent well, and like, looked at each but other. You're underscoring what may be the final motivator to people in the in the election booth, which is, do you really want four more years uh, of just this incessant drumbeat of inanity and and, uh, you know, it's uncouth and uh, unsavory and. And uh, do you want more of it? And I, th I think in the end, some percentage of voters are going to just say, you know, uh, like me, you know, there are things I like, but not much, by the way. Uh, but there's no way I could vote for this again. And so I think you're going to, I think uh, that's going to be the, the last straw. So we'll see. All right. So we in the program with a recommendation. So if you visit the nation's capital someday in some far off land when uh, the pandemic has ended and Washington DC allows you <laughs> the borders, um, are you are you able to visit DC and dine? Well, or I'm actually up here today okay. for so okay. and there are a couple new ones that have opened. But actually, what I'm going to do is a little segue. So I just spent two weeks driving across country to visit my, you know, really. I, from I, my wife and I rented a car for a one-way drive from our island on the Chesapeake Bay to from the island on the Chesapeake Bay. We took two days in Asheville, a day in Memphis. Went to the, you know, Biltmore in Asheville and this and that. And then we went to uh, 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 El the Elvis Museum in Memphis. And then we we went up to Tulsa to see Woody Guthrie's uh, the museum there. It's a it's a just a wonderful museum. And then went on down to Bentonville, Arkansas where Alice Walton of the Walton family, she's the world's wealthiest woman, I think $64 billion, has created a, one of the most fabulous museums and, and settings that you can imagine anywhere, where we stayed in a really great little hotel called the, 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 uh, ho the um, uh, Museum Hotel, which is a hotel with the museum in it, and, uh, and what is reputed to be the best restaurant in um, uh, uh, Bentonville, which may or may not be saying a lot, but it's called the Hive. <laughs> it's very good. There's Casey's, we Casey's had, General had, Store. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> and when you travel, um, you should look up there. It, it's a great, uh, used to be great, is it called the Road Food, which uh, was a lot of little joints all the, along the way. And we managed to find some really great barbecue joints and this and that on the way. Uh, and then we drove from Bentonville to Dallas where my daughter and three-year-old granddaughter and son-in-law live. And and we have big news on that front, which is we have we are expecting a grandson now Excellent. on my birthday, yeah. roughly in April. And uh, then we, the five of us, drove for a couple of days to Austin, rented an Airbnb house with a pool, and and uh, 
and went hiking around. And then my wife and I took two more days while they went back to Dallas and went to uh, wine country in Texas. And so my substitute for meals in, um, in, uh, in DC might be wine in Texas. Who knew they had wine in Texas, right? And, huh? and uh, they have the massive wine growing area in, the, uh, in the, uh, the valley is what they call it. And, uh, and then they bring grapes in from other places, but we, we went to a number of terrific, uh, you know, small wineries. You know, I did a study of wine, wineries and wine uh, back at the beginning of this year. And, um, and what we discovered, which probably some people knew already, is that about 85% of all wineries in this country sell about 85% of all of their wine uh, within 50 miles of where hmm. the winery is sited. So they are entertainment experiences rather than, you know, for the, the fabulousness of the wine. And, uh, but one vineyard that we went to where they grow, grow their own, and, and uh, it's a guy who went to Rice University where I went and his sister who went to Stanford and they have a family winery that was started in, I think about uh, 1999, their parents retired and decided to do it. He was an ex IBM and it's called Peternalis Cellars. And if they, if they, uh, if you happen to be in a wine store and they have out of state wine, it's actually pretty good. A couple of their wines and, uh, you know, they do good Tempranillos in Texas and, and in some parts of Texas, not, not all over. <laughs> and, uh, they do a, a decent Viognier, which we have in Virginia. It's uh, white and, uh, it's great with Turkey. And of course we're all re getting ready for Thanksgiving and uh, trying to figure out how to deal with that, you know, COVIDly, uh, in a way that uh, we, we are all safe. We're, we're telling everybody they have to have a COVID test before they come. And uh, we'll, we wait to hear what my brother has to say about that. He's from Florida. Well, from Florida. I, I'm on a different <laughs> podcast called The Pat Down. And she told me in Atlanta, you can buy a fake uh, COVID test that tests the <laughs> negative. Well, so anyway, uh, you know, so, right. it takes so, and then we flew over. back. Then we flew back. So, and we flew back to my cooking a steak. <laughs> ah, yes. I haven't had anyway. steak in forever. Yeah. Steak, yeah. Well, you should do that sometime. Love steak. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for yeah. being here, Rob. Yeah. Yep. So this is going to be you, interesting with a cleanup after the election. You you were so, one of the first things you told me, you bragged about you being one of the few people predicting a Trump win. I mean, you were, you were very declarative on that last election. Do you want to make one final declaration? Uh, I think Biden will win. Biden. Okay. Trump's going to give everybody a scare. All right. If you're an anti-Trumper. Yeah, I would say that that's probably about right. All right. Well, thank yeah. you so, so much. If everyone wants to bet me a cocktail, I'll do a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. We will see you again in a couple days. And uh, please share this episode if you got something out of it. Recommendations are the lifeblood of a podcast. So we appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll talk to you soon.